everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I'm Claire, a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and today my very special guest is my former co-worker and podcaster co-host, Kirstra. Yay! Hello! <laughs> We are always glad to have Kirster here because it's good to catch up with what she's reading. She is definitely an avid reader and her tastes are a little bit different than mine. So I think it gives yes. us some great perspective into what Absolutely. what to read. So I know. And today we're we're not doing a special theme. We're just doing kind of a roundup of some of our more recent reads. So who knows what we'll we'll talk about today. <laughs> But I'm going to a little bit of everything. I know, I know. I'm going to start with my normal genre, which is historical fiction. But um, and this is something I thought I had sworn off of for a while um, was the World War II fiction. But lo and behold, oh, no. I'm back. I'm back. Here I am. <laughs> um, I picked this one up off a donation card, and it was called "The Postcard" by Anne Barrest. It's also a, a translated novel. It was translated from the French. And here's the setup. This is what drew me in. It's January of 2003, and in the midst of getting like holiday cards and different letters, an anonymous postcard is delivered to the Barrest family home in Paris. And on the front of it is a picture of the Opera Garnier, and on the back of it are the names of Anne Barrest maternal great grandparents, Ephraim and Emma, and their children, Noami and Jacques all of whom were killed at Auschwitz. So the big question is, who sent this postcard? Why now? Um, and Anne's mother had a really, like, a terrible reaction. Like, hers was one of fear. Like, who could have sent this terrible thing? Because um, one of the things that was brought to my attention in this book is you've lost so many family members, but they're essentially in limbo legally. Like you have to go through a lot to declare them dead, to try to, like if you had property, um, land, so forth, there was, huh. there was an immense amount of red tape because the French government really tried to downplay their involvement with taking you know, the Jews and where they had been sent and what had been happened. So a lot of their land was just transferred over to the government or other people in the town that the mayor might have been friends with at the time. Um, so it's almost like a double heartbreak. You know, not only did you lose your family, but you've lost your history. You've lost so many things, photographs, other things. So um, Anne was pregnant at the time, I believe, or, you know, she was at a certain point where she began to ask her mother questions because she remembered when the postcard arrived and she really wanted to know why it was sent and who sent it. So it goes back and forth with um, the original family, which was the Rabinovich family, and how they started in Russia. And then the parents, you know, they were displaced from there and where some of them settled and the parents actually went to Palestine. And um, Ephraim and Emma decided they wanted to go to France. And Ephraim was an inventor. He had several patents pending. And he actually was had filed for French citizenship several times. And as the German occupation got closer and closer, there was like more little reason like, oh, well, we need this document or we need this proof of, you know... Um, so it it was uh it was really eye opening to me. And even though a lot of times I've read a lot of World War II fiction, this was a different type of story because you had the story of the past and then you also have Anne's story in the present because her family pretty much like they were not practicing Jews at all. So she didn't grow up with any of the history, the tradition, the heritage. Mm -hmm. Um but then her young daughter starts to get different comments made to her at school and things happening at, you know, that leads you to believe that, you know, the prejudices and everything else haven't gone away. So you have a modern story with this historical story and how they're trying to come to terms with their religion, their heritage, and what happened to the generations that came before. It was interesting. 
it probably took a little bit too long for me in certain yeah. parts, but yet I found it fascinating. And I would definitely call this a worthwhile read, especially if you enjoy historical fiction, you know, and especially World War II in that time period. And pretty much set almost exclusively in France, except for when they visit the parents in Palestine and so forth. And that was kind of cool, too, to hear yeah. about that. So... Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I know we, we've talked a lot in the past about like dual timelines. Was there one timeline that you gravitated to more than the other? No, actually in this one, I was really interested in both because okay. it, it's a lot of those dual timeline books are like different characters or they're kind of mm -hmm. removed. This was all very centralized around who sent that postcard and why. So that really tied this together. Um, yeah, but you, you, de you get to hear about the occupation and like the times mm -hmm. leading up to the deportations. And that was the really sad part is, is Ephraim was such a good like French citizen. It was like, oh, we've been told to register, so register we must. And, you know, he just yeah. went along with everything. And when they came for his kids, oh, and that was the other thing. I didn't realize there was a real strategy and how these the Jews were taken, like the young mm -hmm. and the strong went first, mm -hmm. um, and then like because the parents went well after um, their younger children were oh, summoned. So yeah, it's like they mm -hmm. took away any like once if people started to know what was going on, the only people that were left were the older and the frailer people. Yeah, the young and the strong that actually could have fought more were mm -hmm. already gone. So. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Very. Well, it sounds very sad, but very interesting. It was sad. I mean, this is not like an uplifting read, but um, but it was definitely an informative and good read, you know. You find out who nice. sent the postcard? Yeah, you do. All right. Yeah. That's kind of redeeming <laughs> because if it's just a slog right. of war and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. E Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, something to tie it together. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. Cool. Well, then I will start with my, my historical fiction pick for this um, this time, um, which I don't read a ton of historical fiction, but Lauren Groth put out a new book last year, and oh. I loved Matrix. I think I talked about it on book. You did. I remembered you really years. liked that book. Um, I did. So I absolutely picked up the Vaster Wilds as soon as there was a copy available on the shelf for me. Um, and I, spoiler alert, I loved this one too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and they are very similar in tone, even though the subject matter is different. So the Vaster Wilds, um, the main character is um, a servant from England who has moved with her family to Jamestown. So they are part of that very first wave of families that comes over after the fort was set up. And um, they plow right into that first really hard winter that um, gets referred to as the starving time. Oh, and another uplifting book for us. <laughs> indeed. So there, there's a lot of like, it was not glamorous to be a colonist. <laughs> like, at all. Um, so the book takes place over the course of just a few days, um, but it starts with our main character escaping from the fort. So kind of sneaking out under cover of night and just taking off. And you get the sense that in addition to just kind of the general horror of a group of people slowly starving to death over the winter because they're completely unprepared for the conditions that they have found. Um, you get the sense that like something particularly terrible has just happened and she's running away from that as much as she's running away from everything else. Um, and then um, the book follows her her goal and it's, it's so sad because this girl, she's um, so naive, she thinks she's going to essentially run to Canada where there are other settlements of Christian people. 
and she's in Jamestown, Virginia. She thinks she's just going to, like, take a couple days. She's going to find the French. I'm like, oh, no. I don't think that's going to go the way you think it's going to go. No. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to give away too much about um, what happens to her. But the story, so we do get some flashbacks of her life in England as a servant um, and then sort of how her family came to move to America. Um, but it's also as she's kind of running through this landscape, she's just seeing like it's a vast, almost untouched wilderness. And it's so amazing to try to imagine what, the U.S. would have looked like, like what this country would have looked like before we took it all over, right? right? Um, so it's just these, it's the vaster wilds, it's just these vast forests and mountain ranges and just the amazing beauty and wonder of the natural world, um, which is, which I really, really loved. Um, so I thought it was beautifully written um it has some of the same sort of um meditative feel that matrix did because a lot of it is is interior like to the in, main our, character. in her head yeah so to speak indeed because i'm um, assuming she has no one to talk to on this journey she does come across a few other people okay in her journey um without again without giving away too much but yes, it is mostly just this solitary person just out in the wilderness of mostly unsettled Virginia. Um, and there's there's not a huge amount of plot to it necessarily. Like I said, it, it takes place over the course of just a few days. Um, but it really is very beautiful and very beautifully written. Um, there's, there's some ugliness that gets contended with as well. Um, but I, I really just loved it. And it's, it's kind of wrapped together at the end. Um, some reviews are calling it a fable. I'm not so sure it's a fable so much as like a commentary on how Europeans have sort of just taken this vast wilderness and turned it into something completely different. Mm -hmm. So, but I loved it. If you read Matrix and you liked it, I would highly recommend this one. I would highly recommend it anyway, but especially if you. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. All right. So my second one is actually a nonfiction and it's a memoir and I also do Storygraph in addition to Goodreads, and there was a In Case You Missed It challenge, which encourages mm -hmm. you to read books from the backlist. So this one was from 2012, and one of my college friends also recommended this book. So I was like, oh, what the heck? It kind of fits both categories. She recommended it. I'm going to go for it. It's called Mrs. Kennedy and Me, and it is by Clint Hill, who was her personal secret service agent when John F. Kennedy was president of the United States. Um, so the setup was Clint Hill is this young secret service agent, and he was on President Dwight Eisenhower's detail. So mm -hmm. when he finds out, you know, when he's summoned in after Kennedy is elected that he's been assigned to Jacqueline's detail, he's initially kind of disappointed you know to him it's almost like a demotion okay i've gone from like the main event to now i'm gonna be watching mrs kennedy and the kids so um but he grew a lot to respect her and he definitely had a very unique relationship with her she i believe there was another secret service agent that was initially resigned to her that she was just like nope no no connection here done um so she could be pretty formidable and then he, he actually got very fond of her because there wasn't a lot of precedent for having a young family 
in the White House and you had Caroline and then baby John was born. And, you know, I think President Kennedy wasn't there when John was born. So they had to get her to the hospital, you know, and were there. Um, so it was different. And a lot of his time was spent like with her, like she chose to be out of the limelight a lot. She rode horses, so they had a place in Virginia that she went to. Um, you know, there were different, these are people of privilege. So you had like the winter house in Palm Springs that the Kennedys had, and then you had the summer house up in Hyannisport that they had. So he's going all over, and I believe he eventually did get divorced because, you know, he doesn't see his own family, his <laughs> own children. That's all sacrificed because you have to follow the schedule. And they weren't really high paid either. I mean, it wasn't like a real lucrative mm. career. I guess it was very much a career of service. But, um, and if you're looking for a tell all, like with, any of the nastiness with John F. Kennedy or affairs or whatever. This is not that book. Um, he's very respectful and kind of keeps it away from that, if you will, and focuses more on Mrs. Kennedy, what she did, you know, with refurbishing the White House and some of the political things that she did and all of her trips, um, like when they went to Paris, she was the one that really the people in Paris loved because she could speak mm -hmm. French, she had studied there. And even when they went to, like she went, did some independent trips, Pakistan, mm -hmm. India, I think, Greece. Um, that was the one thing that he, the president did pull him aside for the trip and said, make sure she doesn't get on the Onassis ship. That's all I ask. And wasn't that funny? Oh. Later on, she ended up marrying him. But, you know, yeah. Uh, and he often wondered, like, huh, why, what was that all about? But, um, yeah, so it was very interesting. And, of course, near the end of the book, it's, it's also really sad. I've just had a month of really sad reads because um, she lost another child. Like, uh, her son Patrick was born, died. And then not long after that, they were already thinking about campaigning. And of course, made that fateful trip to Dallas. And mm -hmm. one of the president's decisions was is they had a car and there was space for the civil, I mean, uh, Secret Service to ride like on the back or the sides of the car. And he didn't mm -hmm. want that. He wanted to be seen by the people. He was very much a, like when they would get to the airport, that was the one thing the Secret Service agents, because he talked a lot with the people that were detailing, you know, Jack and you know Jacqueline is he would just shoot off like to go into the crowd and shake hands and do things and they would just like no oh, you know um, just very hard to protect and when you think of that massive job of keeping these people safe and how many opportunities there are for things to go wrong um, yeah so he goes into a lot of detail of what happened on that fateful day I don't want to you know go into all that but yeah that's just real quick is he in the Zapruder film, is he in that famous? Like, does he show up in the clip? Yeah, like, is he one yes, of the guys climbing into the car? he was the one that jumped into, into the, the car. He climbed into the that's car <gasps> over, over oh, like, Mrs. Kennedy. That's wild. Oh, yeah. Man. Holy yes. cow. All right. That, so, that actually, I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear that perspective yes. that he has. Yeah. Um, yeah, and wow. he got a, what is it, a bronze star? He got something. Really? Um, and he was like, I, I didn't really want the award because even though I protected her, I feel like I should have protected him. Like we oh. should have been on that car. Um, and he had gotten up and jumped up once or twice, you know, just cause he said that the, the outside noise and just seeing all the windows and seeing everything, they were getting very jittery. Um, so <laughs> yeah, but he, he did, he was one of the people, he was the guy that jumped That's in wild. and jumped wow. over the, you know, to, to jump on top of her. So yeah. Um, so that, you know, that was interesting. So if you like history and you like memoirs, he also wrote another one that was more detailed about his travels with her um, all over, you know, the world and what she did. Like the, I'm trying to think if it was the prime minister of Pakistan, but he gave her a horse and like her concern was like, I want this race horse and I want it, you know, we're not going to go through customs. This horse is good, you know. Um, 
So, but she had that link in common with some of those people, you know, but Mm -hmm. so it's interesting to read about a, the privileged life and how these people lived. Um, And that was some of the criticism I saw from some people like, oh, you know, they weren't typical Americans, like who gets to have staff raise their children or do this or that, but you know, whatever it's worth. Presidents do. Yes. Presidents get to do that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so it was, yeah, like first ladies that could take long vacations, shop, visit with friends, ride horses, sail on yachts. Well, yeah, when, when you're uber rich, that does happen. Um, yeah. Well, and she came from money too, didn't she? Yes. I, I yeah. believe her mother had remarried, like her original okay. father might have had so, but they were like very high. Like, I think his yeah. father was very pleased that he was marrying her. Because he saw her as a, an asset, you know. Sure. So, yeah. Hmm. That does sound super interesting. Yeah. I'm debating reading yeah. the second one. Because I think he yeah. found like a trunk. Like he hadn't thought about it mm-hmm. um, in, a, in many, many years. And he found a trunk. And at mm-hmm. this point, his wife is the woman that helped him co-write these books, which I don't think it's oh. not his first wife that he had okay. during this time period. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. I know, like, people are still super duper interested in the Kennedys. Like, however many decades later, like, just absolutely fascinated by that family. Right. Yeah. They're still... And Sean and I were talking about, like, the Kennedy curse, like, all the tragedy Mm -hmm. that's happened in that family. Yeah. um, Well, it feels dynastic, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like royalty that Americans are still very Mm -hmm. obsessed about. Right. It's never getting that out of us. No. You know? No, it's a part of our our history at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. Nice. All right. Um, My second book is a mystery by Nina Simon. It is Mother Daughter Murder Night. Oh, I read this one too. Uh, you did? Yeah. Okay. So I liked it. Um, I thought I didn't like it didn't blow me out of the water, but I really liked it. Um, so the setup is that there is um, so our main character Lana, Lana Rubicon um, is like a LA real estate mogul and she just collapses one day in her kitchen and comes to find out that she has cancer um, and is going to need to undergo some very serious treatment for it. And she can't do it by herself. So she is kind of forced to move in with and rely on help from her daughter, who moved out, her daughter Beth, who moved out at 16 when she got pregnant. Um, so Lana has to live with Beth and her granddaughter, Jack, short for Jacqueline, um, and who have, um, a very different lifestyle than what Lana has. Um, and Lana is a bit of a control freak. Just um, a bit. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Um, and Beth is more sort of a, you know, free spirit. Um, they live in a little house right next to, um, uh, these wetlands um, heading out into the ocean and it's all very like kind of hippie like nature and all of the decor is like homemade and whatever it's, and Lana, it's very like, crunchy granola in my words yes, yes absolutely um, and Lana is just like losing her mind <laughs> being stuck in this house and um, so of course what happens is that Lana, um, who is having trouble sleeping, she's, like, seeing things happen out in these wetlands at night. She's, like, peering with binoculars, and she sees a a wheelbarrow in the middle of the night. Something may be going into the creek. And then the next day, um, Jack, who leads these kayak tours of the wetlands, um, discovers a body floating in the water. So that kind of kicks us off. So, of course, um, Jack is sort of initially not quite implicated in this, but the police are very interested in her because it was her tour that found the body. And there's 
some other connections. Um, so Lana decides that she is going to investigate in order to clear her granddaughter's name. And then like exactly what you think is going to ensue ensues. So like Lana and Jack start working together and then Beth kind of gets drawn in and they slowly start to like figure out how to be a family instead of just like being at each other's throats all the time. Um, they are able, and this is not, this is really not a spoiler. They are able to clear Jack because of course they are. Um, and they like continue on to try and figure out who actually did this murder. Um, so there's, you know, a whole web of intrigue that they uncover um, and everyone is able to sort of contribute little bits to the investigation because of their sort of specialized knowledge. Like Lana looks at all of these real estate records and is able to like figure some things out and Jack knew the wetlands really well. So she's able to figure some things out. So like that, but it is, it's very sweet. Um, it is, it moves enough that like, like this book does not drag, it moves. So you never get bored. Um, it's pretty, um, pretty tight. The yeah. story I thought. Um, so it's not, I would say there aren't really any surprises there, but what it does, it does well. Yeah, this one was a Reese's pick. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say if you like cozy mysteries, this one might appeal to you as well. Because mm -hmm. it kind of has that element to it a little bit. Um, yeah. Kind yeah. of straddles the edge of, of right. cozy mystery. Right. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, I like that one too. Like you okay. said, it's not like the the paramount of, you know, fiction. Right. But it was just fun and entertaining. Yeah. So. Yeah. And not I'll, breaking new ground, but yeah. it, what it does, it does really well. Right. And the characters yeah. were pretty likable, quirky, yes. funny. So I agree. So my last one, I'm diving into the the mysteries as well, but not not with a too favorable one. It was uh, uh -oh. the author of The Silent Patient has a new thriller mystery out. It's called The Fury by Alex Michalides. Mm -hmm. And this is a tale of murder, but this is also one of these unreliable narrator tropes, which I am so done with these. <laughs> Time to move on. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so if you like unreliable narrator tropes, this is the book for you. But um, <laughs> it's told from the viewpoint of a man that is at the whole proceedings, but you can tell he has issues. So anyway, mm -hmm. this, this startup is, uh, the setup is Lana Falar. She is a reclusive ex-movie star, one of the most famous women in the world. You know, I'm thinking Elizabeth Taylor, you know. This is who I'm picturing in my mind. Mm -hmm. But every year she invites her closest friends to escape the English weather and spend Easter on her idyllic private Greek island. So, <laughs> yes, and this, this story, of course, there was a murder. It was all in the tabloids, and your narrator is going to give you an exclusive eye view into everything that transpired this fateful weekend. So, of course, they're trapped there overnight. The fury is like a word for the storms or the winds that mm -hmm. hit this particular part of Greece. Um, so naturally, you know, they're all marooned there. It's kind of like a closed, closed door, Agatha Christie, mm -hmm. you know, and then there were, no, what is it? 10 little. And then there were none. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of feel like he's paying homage to that, mm -hmm. but, um, Anyway, so the, the narrator is Elliot Chase, and he's supposedly like a best friend to Lana. But, um, of course, he has, uh, Lana has a child, you know, she has a current husband. So there's a lot of bickering. There's a lot of other people involved that none of these people are likable, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which is another problem for me. It's like, I, I yeah. want to be pulling for somebody in, in this book. But um, so the, the first half was kind of slow for me. And the narrator is constantly promising this wild twist. Um, 
So much so that when you get to the wacky climax at the end, it, it's just to me, I was like, okay, I, I don't, I don't care about any of you anymore. You know, I, I really don't. <laughs> but I've, I've read too much of this book to stop reading. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, that's how I felt. So I'll be real curious to hear if other people felt the same or if I am just, and I realize that this could be true, is this, I've just read so many of these that they're just too formulaic for me at this point or too preposterous, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. I, I just can't buy in. I'd rather have mm -hmm. almost like the mystery that you talked about, which I kind of know, you know, in a sense, rather than expecting this wild twist that to me just mm -hmm. comes up to be, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I got to tell you, I did not love The Silent Patient. Yeah. Um, I think we read it for Pints and Prose a million years ago, and I I was underwhelmed. Like, he strikes me as an author who is, like, very convinced of his own cleverness. Yes, yes. And I was not as convinced as he was. Right. I, I feel like sense. you're in the room with a person that's, like, giving you the side eye, and you're like, I'm not finding this funny. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I. So if you thought the silent patient was like that, mm -hmm. this is silent patient on steroids. <laughs> if that's an apt so, description. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna be giving that one a miss, probably. Yeah, yeah. I would say that that would probably be fitting for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So interesting. Yeah. The fury. Nice. Yeah. So what's right. your last one? Bring us up into My last uh, one um, was actually one that I was super excited about, which was Come and Get It by Kylie Reed, um, who was the author of Such a Fun Age. So I had no idea that this book was coming out. Um, I just saw it on the shelf and I was like, oh my God, Kylie Reed has a new book. And I took it home and started it and I loved this book. Um, so it is different than Come and Get It in that like the, the setting is totally different, the characters are different. What is kind of the same is that um, everyone in it is complicated. Like there's no one character that you're like, that one person did everything right and everyone else like messed up in various ways. Like very much um, about shades of gray and like how perspectives shift from person to person. Um, so our main characters are uh, Millie Cousins is a 24 year old senior at the University of Arkansas. She works as an RA in one of the dorms. Um, she is older because she had to take some time off to go home and help her mother through some health issues. So she's a little bit older than everyone, but she's still, like, right in that sort of college view. Um, we have Agatha Paul, who is a nonfiction author um, and professor who's taken a year off from um, her work in Chicago to come to University of Arkansas and teach for a year. Um, she has a relationship that is, like, crumbling into pieces in Chicago, um, so you get the sense a little bit that she's just trying to get some distance from that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and she's also researching for a new book, um, that she thinks is going to be about weddings and wedding culture, um, and ends up taking kind of a turn. And then we have a group of three, um, suite mates in the dorm where Millie is an RA. Um, so they're all upperclassmen, but this is the dorm that she's in is for like scholarship students and transfer students. So none of them like really know each other. They're just kind of thrown together into this situation. Um, so we follow those kind of, it's the three kind of groups. So Millie and Agatha, and then this group of three suite mates. Um, and you can tell from the beginning that, like, 
it's one of those like webs are drawing together and mm -hmm. you can tell that it's heading somewhere um, and probably not somewhere great, um, but you don't really have any idea, or at least I didn't, as to what was going to happen, like what was going to be the big event um, towards the end. So that was definitely surprising. Um, we got a very satisfying amount of aftermath to the big event. So that's one of my pet peeves is like when something big happens and then everything just wraps up and you're done. Right. <laughs> so big, big bow, you know. Exactly. So all of the characters um, have to kind of contend with this thing that happens. Um, and you get a fair amount of time with each one of them afterwards to kind of see how it is that they grapple with it. And everyone is um, affected by it. Everyone is a, a little bit implicated in it. Like there's no one that is blameless in the scenario. So I thought, I think that's super interesting because um, it's all sort of shades of gray. Um, it's all like just people grappling with being people and like having to deal with the consequences of their choices and their actions. Um, I did think that characters were very sympathetic. I think Millie is probably the most sympathetic. She's also the person I think we spend the most time with. Um, so if there's one person that the book really kind of centers around, it's probably Millie. Um, but I, I just thought it was super interesting. So you get issues of um, race and class, um, you know, which which characters are at school on scholarship, which characters are there because, you know, they have very wealthy parents that are just you know, paving the way for them. So really kind of grapples with a lot of those issues without necessarily trying to say like, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. It's just like, these are all different ways and let's, kind of look at them and see what happens when they come together. Well, so. that that was one thing I really liked about her her other book, Such a Fun mm -hmm. Age, is that she took some of those issues. And like you said, to me, the characters weren't cookie cutters. Like there were good parts mm -hmm. of the characters and there were kind of like cringy parts to the characters. Yeah. But that's how most people are. We're not all like exactly. good or bad or, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. I... I thought it would make a great book discussion book. I don't think I got my group mm -hmm. to to read it. Did Pines and Prose ever read that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think it was always still too popular. Yeah. Um, when I was there, like, there were never enough copies on the shelf for me to do it. Okay. So. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that one and I think this one would also make a, an excellent discussion book. I'll have to add sure. this one to my list. Sounds like something yeah. I would like to read. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I would be so interested to talk with you about it. Oh, good. If you read it. <laughs> I love talking books with you. So Absolutely. For sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I think yeah, we've just... got some good picks here for people mm -hmm. to choose from. A lot of them are Definitely. newer, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I had the one kind of oldie in the group, but... um. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Maybe we can visit again and check out. Do you still like sci-fi and fantasy? And Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes, for sure. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, call me back anytime. I love book break. I okay. love doing this with you. Well, we love having you. So, thanks for joining us, Kirstra. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. Next time, we're going to be talking about books that we are suggested to us. So we have a Monday night Facebook book chat now. So um, another librarian, Molly and I are going to be talking about some of the books that we read because of book chat. So tune in next time. And uh, thanks for joining us, Kirstra. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Book Break is a production of the Greece Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Greece Public Library. The music composed and performed by Sean.